Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. As you're turning there, uh, you can look at these verses as well. This You'll see why I uh, am reading these verses out of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 26. It's very apropos for what we're looking at this morning. It says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. He didn't say not any, but not many. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the, the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God. And that wisdom we have from God is infinitely better than any knowledge you can get out of the worldly institutes around us. So pray for those who are starting up at CMU once again. Um, the Bible is the best book of all. Um, and righteousness. You're never going to be righteous apart from Jesus. And sanctification. He has set us apart. And redemption. We've been redeemed by His blood. And, and he says that, as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. And so, as we'll see in this section this morning, um, all the glory has to go to Jesus, because we're just nothing uh, apart from him. We can do nothing except for getting ourselves in trouble. We can just make a big mess of things, but we need to yield to the Lord. And so, one of Satan's biggest lies that he's thrust upon the body of Christ is that ministry is only for the professionals. Don't believe it. It's only for those who have extensive training. He'll say it's only for those who are well-versed in the ancient languages. Hey, if you know Greek and Hebrew, praise the Lord. He'll say, but it's only for those who have reached a certain level of spirituality. Well, if that was the case, most of us in here would be in big trouble. We'd be disqualified. Very few people would be involved in ministry at all. But fortunately, God has a sense of humor. Uh, he takes the humble, the simple the ordinary, and He can use us to do extraordinary things as we yield our lives to Him. Um, yeah, He'll use gifted men like the Apostle Paul. I mean, Paul had a, a great background. He was a man of education, a man of influence, a great heritage, a religious zeal. He'll use anybody who will humble themselves before the Lord and surrender their lives to Jesus Christ. But He seems to especially enjoy using those whom the world deems, you know, clueless. Um, that the world has a tendency to look their, uh, down their noses at. And by me saying at at the end of a sentence is what I'm referring to. In fact, that seems to be the pattern throughout the Bible. Um, God uses ordinary people to do marvelous things in and through them. And when God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldeans, um, he and Sarah just dwelt in tents. They were nomads. When God called Moses, you know, Moses says, I can't speak. Uh, he had a speech impediment. You know, he was terrified to go back to Egypt, and yet God used him. And he was just a simple sheep herder at that time for 40 years. Then there was David. God chose David to be king over Israel, even though he was the least in his family. He was the eighth son. You know, and that means he had hardly any privileges. The firstborn was the one that everybody looked up to. And so he was the eighth son. And God told Samuel the prophet to go to the house of Jesse. And he was going to anoint one of the sons that God would tell him to anoint to be the next king of Israel because King Saul had blown it. So Jesse brings his firstborn to Samuel. And when Samuel takes a look at Eliab, you know, he says, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Now, why do you think Samuel thought that? Because Eliab, again, he was the firstborn. Uh, in short, he was tall, dark, and handsome. And immediately after, he said, this is the guy, this is the one. This is what we read in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him, I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And that's, that's the awesome thing, is God doesn't care about the outward. He, he looks at the heart. 
He isn't impressed with power suits and power ties or cars that make a statement. He doesn't care if you spend a thousand dollars on your hair and makeup. I'm going to get in trouble. Um, God is not impressed by how many, you know, letters you have before or after your name. But what God cares about is the condition of our hearts. And so after Jesse brings his seven oldest sons before Samuel, and you know they all come passing by, they're all handsome, they're all good looking, and you know he's like, sorry, God's not picking this one, he's not picking this one, not that one either. It's almost as if he's saying, you know, Jesse, don't you have any homely looking kids in your family? No, they're all handsome, they're all good looking, and so I've got one more out there in the field with the sheep, little David out there, and so he says, bring him in, and as soon as David comes in, the Lord says, arise, anoint him. You know, he is the one. And so again, we're so prone to judge people by their stature, by their social status, but God looks at the heart. Now, some of you might be thinking, yeah, but my heart isn't all that great either. Well, that's okay, because the good news is Jesus changes hearts. Jesus is great at replacing carnal hearts, fleshly hearts, with his heart, a heart that beats for Jesus. Jesus can change your heart. He can soften your heart. He can purify and cleanse your heart. And once God has a hold of your heart, then he can do extraordinary things through your ordinary life. And we see this throughout the Bible. And that's what we discover in the life of Peter and John. Uh, most of the other disciples we see in the book of Acts, they were far from the cream of the crop. They were just ordinary fishermen. And you know, yet, you know, the Lord would use them. And the simple reason why God would use them is because they were sold out to Jesus. You have to be sold out to Jesus. You can't have one foot in the world, one foot in heaven, so to speak, and think God's going to use you. you. You've put yourself on a shelf. You've grieved. You've quenched the Holy Spirit. But we need to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit according to the truth of God's Word. But if we will humble ourselves before Him, He'll use you. You know, not just here. He'll use you in school. He'll use you at work. He'll use you in your neighborhood because there's a lot of people that need to hear about Jesus. Now, we left off with Peter uh, preaching the gospel to the Sanhedrin and these other religious people that were there, probably about 100 people, and uh, he gives this powerful message. And so let me back up again. Look at verse 7. We got to verse 12, but let's look at verse 7 here in Acts chapter 4. It says, when they had set them in the midst, again, what happened, Acts chapter 3, they're going to the temple to pray. It's about 3 in the afternoon. As they're coming there, there's this man who was over 40 years. He's born lame. They lay him at the beautiful gate, and he was expecting a handout, an alm. You know, just, you know, do you have any shekels you can give me? And as Peter and John are walking towards him, you know, Peter says, look at us, expecting to receive something. And he says, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. We saw immediately the guy was instantly healed. He begins leaping and jumping, praising the Lord. He goes into the temple with them. He's all excited. And then all the people, they rush to Peter thinking he's a miracle worker. And they want to lift up Peter. And he's like, no, 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 I didn't do anything. It's not me. It's Jesus whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. Here's the reason why this guy's made whole. And so... We see the same thing here. They um, arrest Peter and John after 2,000 more people get saved, and they bring him before the religious leaders. And so they asked him, you know, by what power, by what name have you done this? Verse 8, we saw this last week again. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well? Again, the Greek word sozo means um, physically saved, healed, spiritually saved, eternal life. Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, again, the gospel in a nutshell there, by him, this man stands here before you whole. And so this guy that's healed, he's standing there on trial with Peter and John. 
And then he says in verse 11, this is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Again, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. He's quoting from Psalm 118 here. And then he says in verse 12, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The name Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Now look at verse 13. Here's where we pick up, and this is... One of my favorite verses because he says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they re realized that they had been with Jesus. Again, the reason this is one of my favorite verses is it speaks volumes about how God can use simple people who humble themselves before the Lord and God can do marvelous things through our lives. As all these religious leaders are looking down at Peter and John, they quickly realize these guys are uneducated. These guys are untrained. The word uneducated means they're unlettered. We would say they're illiterate. You know, they look at these guys as a couple of country bumpkins. The Sadducees perceived wrong. When they say, you know, they look at them and they perceived they're uneducated, they're untrained. They're totally wrong. I bet Peter and John knew more of the Bible. They certainly knew more of the Jewish Messiah than these guys. These religious leaders had no clue who Jesus was. Jesus told them, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but these are they which speak of me. The whole Old Testament, it's all about Jesus. And that's why Peter and John were so... Amazing here is because they knew the Word of God, they knew Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and they, they knew more than all these religious leaders combined. Over and over again, we see the Scriptures come pouring out of their mouths, pouring out of their hearts. How does that happen? Well, you've got to get the Word of God into your heart, because what's in your heart will come out of your mouth. When you get the Word of God in there, then the Holy Spirit will bring it to remembrance. He'll use you to speak truth into people's lives. How did Peter, uh, Peter and John know so much about the Bible? Well, three and a half years with Jesus certainly helped. Every Sabbath, they were there hearing the rabbis reading from the Old Testament scriptures. And so they learned the word of God. Like Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So Peter and John may not have had a lot of book smarts, but God used them in amazing ways. And so what this tells me is that God will use anyone who is sold out to Jesus. So don't let Satan deceive you. Don't let Satan tell you that you don't have enough formal training to be used by the Lord. He can use you if you say, Here I am, Lord, send me. And God will. Now verse 13 also tells us they perceived Peter and John to be untrained men. This is one of my favorite words in the Greek, untrained. The Greek word is idiotes. <laughs> what do you think that refers to? I mean, literally, they look at these guys as idiots. These are just some idiots here. These self-righteous religious leaders look down on Peter. Again, they thought they were just these hicks from Galilee. They don't know an adjective from a verb, from a noun. They probably said ain't a lot. They probably ended a lot of sentences with at, like I did earlier. You know, where's our fishing nets at? That's probably how they talked. And so these leaders are kind of mocking, they're ridiculing Peter and John, but at the same time it says they marveled, they were amazed at their boldness. They were amazed that they knew the Scripture so well. And again, where did that knowledge come from? Look at the last sentence in verse 13. It says, And they realized that they had been with Jesus. And that is something that I truly desire for all of us this morning here is that we would be people out in the world where the world would recognize we've been with Jesus, that we're walking with Him, that we believe Him, that we believe His Word. When all is said and done, that's what it all boils down to, you have been with Jesus. Jesus has changed your life. You know, at the end of my life, you can stick up my tombstone, He loved Jesus, and now He's with Jesus. I mean, that's, that's it. We don't need anything more. The awesome truth, though, is even greater than what they perceived. They perceived that they had been with Jesus, past tense, but the fact of the matter is Jesus is right there standing with them right now. They don't see Jesus, but He is with them. 
as these religious leaders are looking down on these three men, there's a fourth one. Remember when I talked about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego last week? Nebuchadnezzar builds this 90-foot gold statue of himself. No ego problem there. He tells everybody, when you hear the sound of the lyre, the trumpet, and the harp, you know, bow down to this. And they're like, we're not going to bow down to that. I'll give you one more chance. When you hear the music, nah, nah, you can do whatever you want with us. We're not going to bow down to this. I'm going to put you in the fiery furnace. That's okay. God can spare us or he'll take us home, whatever. We're not going to bow down. Heat it up seven times hotter. They throw him in. And it says even the guards that threw him in died. It was so hot. And then when Nebuchadnezzar looks in there, he says, wow, I see, or didn't we throw in three men? I see four. And the fourth looks like the son of God. Well, that was Jesus. He was in the midst with them. It's like with Daniel when he was throwing the lion's den. You know, the lion's just, he laid down. It was like a big fluffy pillow. There's the lion. They didn't eat him up. As soon as the bad guys were thrown in there, they ate him up. But not God's people. The Lord is with His people. No matter what trial, no matter what you're going through, don't ever forget, He is with us always. 2 Timothy 4, 16 and 17 that's what Paul says just before he has his head chopped off, literally. Paul says, At my first offense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And so you can be assured that whenever you face a harsh, fiery trial, Jesus will always be there with you. He's not going to leave you. That's the last thing he said, one of the last things he said before he ascended. Lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. Uh, Hebrews 13, 5 says, I will neither, I will never leave you and I'll never forsake you. I mean, that's the promise we have from the Lord. And so don't ever forget, Jesus is right here. He lives in you, and He's also with you. He's with you always. And we should always have that living uh, relationship with the Lord, where we're growing in that relationship with Him. If you are growing in that relationship, you will learn more, you will grow more than if you went to the greatest seminary on earth. Literally. I mean, seminary can teach you a lot of stuff, but not how to draw near to Jesus and not experience Him walking with you through those fiery trials. What better teacher could you have than the Holy Spirit opening up your heart to receive and understand God's Word? To have that confidence, to have that assurance that Jesus is with you no matter what, wherever you go, wherever you are. Verse 14. By the way, we're not going to get through the whole chapter. In seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. In other words, these religious leaders, how could they argue? They can't argue with Peter and John. I mean, here's the guy. Everybody knew him. Everybody saw this guy for 40 years. And now he's healed. He's standing there with them. There's no debate. The proof is this guy is a changed man. Now, it's wonderful to see that this healed man is standing with Peter and John. You know, he was healed. He's jumping, leaping, praising the Lord. He could have said, you know what? These guys are in trouble. They're in a mess. I'm going to get out of here. I can now run. Let me see how these legs work. But no, he's like, I'm going to stand with these two guys. They were there when I got saved. And now they're in trouble. I'm going to stand right there with them. I'm not going to bail on them. Now, people can criticize you. They can call you a Jesus freak. They say, you go to church, you read your Bible. But you know something? They can't escape the fact that you are a changed person. Something wonderfully different is about you. And that is something that the world cannot comprehend. Jesus has changed your life. And people can say whatever they want, but they can't argue with the fact that you were this way, now you're this way. You're a new creation in Christ. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. How wonderful it is to know that I don't have to waste my life and my money on the old sinful, wicked things that I used to do in this world because now in Christ I have new priorities, I have new desires, I have new goals. I'm a changed person. Instead of drinking from the polluted waters of this sinful world, I can now drink from the rivers of living water. 
I can now feast upon the bread of life, Jesus himself. This guy's changed life. That's his greatest testimony. You know, he could say, I've been you know, disabled. I've been crippled for over 40 years. But just a few hours ago, I got healed. I got saved. Who's going to argue with that? Who can deny that? These religious leaders, they couldn't make him doubt what God had done in his life. He was a new creation. Verse 15. And when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. There has been such a notable change in this guy's life, they couldn't deny it. Is there a notable change in your life to where your friends, your former friends maybe, your family members, they cannot deny it? People who knew me before I was a Christian were amazed at the changes Jesus made in my life. No more swearing, no more cursing, no more out of the you know, control partying, you know, no more anger. I was very bitter. I had a lot of violence in my life. But the funny thing was when Jesus saved me, my family members and those I thought were my friends, they thought I went off the deep end. It's like, we miss the old Jeff. I was like, what? I don't miss the old Jeff. He was miserable. I was depressed. I was angry. You know, I was just gone. But praise the Lord, I was saved. I was set free. But all those who knew me recognized that a notable miracle took place in my life. And they couldn't deny it. It's like, a, I was, it was a radical conversion, a radical change. But most of them, even like we'll see with the Apostle Paul, when he gets saved, most of them didn't want anything to do with me afterwards. And so you end up with a whole new set of friends, brothers and sisters in Christ. And why did they not want to hang around me? Because I didn't want to walk in those same ways that they were walking in. You know, Peter says it really powerfully, you know, I think many of you can relate to this. First Peter chapter 4, look at verses 3 and 4. Uh, Peter says, For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. And that's a reference to those who don't know the Lord. When we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they, your former friends, Think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation or wastefulness. Now they speak evil of you. And so do people you hang out with, people you work with, do they realize you're hanging out with Jesus? Do they realize that you are different, you're a new creation? Do they see a difference in your life? And then don't be surprised if they say, well, knock it off. I don't want you shining the light in my eyes. You know, you can believe what you want to believe, but leave me alone. Now, we might not be able to reach out and pick somebody up and say, I don't have much, but in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Although God can still do that, and I've seen Him do it. But we can all share the gospel with them. We can all share the good news that Jesus loves them. And how do we know He, loved them? he loves them? Because He died on the cross. He shed His blood for their sins. He rose from the dead, and it's because He's alive right now. He's offering them the free gift of eternal life. Don't ever think that God can't use you. you know, he wants to use you. Look at verse 17. But so that it spreads, and these are the religious leaders, but so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they called them, and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Satan loves to try and intimidate us and threaten us. It's okay for you to believe in Jesus, but just don't tell anybody else about Jesus. That's the world's attitude. When I worked for the school district here, and I was working in the warehouse, this is long before we started the church, um, you know, I talked to a couple of the guys. They were both here first service, Ron Adino and uh, Jimmy Priya. And, you know, they were kind of walking with the Lord. I didn't tell them this first service. <laughs> but I said, hey, guys, why don't we start a Bible study during our lunch break? 
And we'll just invite some of the other warehouse workers. They're all worldly guys, you know, and, and they said, oh, okay, let's do that. So we started meeting on our lunch break and I, I invited the other guys in the warehouse and they'd pop in now and then, hear what we're talking about, you know, talking about the rapture or whatever it was, you know, just end times things and going through Gospel of John. And, you know, they were like growing in the Lord. It was pretty cool. And then our supervisor says, you can't do that. It's like, what do you mean I can't do that? Well, you can't be having a Bible study here on public property. This is the school property. And it's like, you don't pay me for my lunch break. You can't tell me what to do or what not to do on my lunch break. And so well, I'll have to take this up the ladder. So it ends up going up the ladder, and it went all the way to the district, the school board. And so I get this formal letter from them, and it basically was saying what these guys said. You know, you can do what you want on your lunch break, but don't proselytize anybody. And I'm like, whatever. You know, put your heads together and make a rock pile. That's fine. You know, we're going to keep teaching. So, you know, you got to do what God's called you to do. You know, every time I've been in Israel, so five times I've been in Israel, four of the times we go up in the Temple Mount. And I love, you know, going on the Temple Mount because, you know, as you head over the other side, the, the north side of the Dome of the Rock, there's this open courtyard area. And that's probably where the Temple will be built by the Antichrist agreeing with the Arabs and Jews to allow them to build the Temple there. Um, it right lines up with the eastern gate, and then you see the Mount of Olives in the background. And there's a little gazebo-like thing there. It's called the Dome of the Spirit, or the Dome of the Tablets. And it's a sacred place. And so I like to go over there, and then I'll start doing a Bible study. can't have a Bible there, but you just start doing a Bible study. You talk about Jesus is going to set his feet on the Mount of Olives. He's going to come through the Golden Gate, and it's going to be this and that, you know, just going on. And so as I'm, I'm talking about all these things, as we're working our way over to the Dome of the Tablets, and this was in 2010. The uh, there was two guards there, you know, the whatever Palestinian guys with their guns, and and they're sitting there, you know, on the gazebo. It's like a little, you know, curbing around it, and they're just sitting there and they're smoking, and and then I I'm just keep talking about the Lord and working. And it's behind me, and I keep backing up, and they, hey, you can't get in here. It's like, what do you mean? You can't come in here. And it's like, why? Because this is a holy place. And like, as he's throwing a cigarette butt in the holy place, it's like, okay, that's fine. And I just keep talking about Jesus. And I end up going in, in the holy place and just giving a Bible study there and they're listening. And then they finally just leave us alone. You know, people are like, oh, wow, weren't you afraid? It's like, why are you going to be afraid? You do what God called you to do. You just go in the power of the Holy Spirit and he'll take care of you. And you don't have to live in fear. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world, right? So we just do what God's called us to do. But don't be intimidated by those around you. If God calls you to do something, then be bold like these guys, Peter and John. Speak the truth of Jesus in love. If you get mocked or ridiculed, God will take care of you. He's our great shepherd. He's our defender. He is our provider. And so we don't need to worry about the, the lies of the enemy. And again, I just quoted it, First John 4, 4 where John writes, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Remember the little greater than sign? So Jesus, who is in you, is much greater than, infinitely greater than Satan who is in the world. Jesus, co-creator of the heavens and the earth, created Lucifer. So he's just a fallen angel. So don't fear the devil. Stand in the power of the Holy Spirit. Stand in the power of Jesus, and you can defeat the lies of the enemy. Look at verse 19. So they tell him, stop speaking in his name. Don't teach in the name of Jesus. Verse 19, but Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. In other words, forget it, guys. We're eyewitnesses of Jesus, whom you crucified, by the way, whom God raised from the dead. And Jesus told us to take this gospel message, this good news, all over the place. Remember in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you'll receive power and the Holy Spirit comes upon you. It'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And so that's what we're going to do. The Great Commission. Take this to all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How can we keep the fact that Jesus died for our sins to ourselves? That's what Peter's saying. 
How can we keep the fact that he rose from the dead? We're eyewitnesses of that to ourselves. How can you and I keep the truth that Jesus saved us, delivered us from the domain of darkness? He's brought us into the kingdom of his beloved son. How can we keep that to ourselves? We need to let people know. The Apostle Paul says, Woe unto me if I do not preach the gospel. The prophet Jeremiah had one of the most unpopular ministries of all time. He was hated by the people. He was warning the people, judgment is coming. The temple is going to be destroyed. The Babylonians are going to take over. And he had all these false prophets. They're like, don't listen to him. He's not speaking for God. We still got the temple. We're fine. And, And he got to the point where he was so discouraged, so dejected by all the rejection of the people. He basically tells God, I quit. I'm not going to mention you anymore. I'm not going to speak anymore in your name. But just as quickly as he said that, he then says, but his word was in my heart like a burning fire. And I could not hold back from letting it out. In other words, he could not stop speaking about God and the word of God. He knew he was just a vessel that God wanted to flow in and flow through. How much more should our hearts burn within us because we, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. We have Jesus dwelling in us. We have the Father dwelling in us. Like Peter and John, we need to speak the things which we have seen and heard. You know, the, the American church is in big trouble today, and I think part of the reason why is because they don't want to share the gospel. They, they want to become just ingrown. They just want it to be a feel-good f- club for the people that come here. They want you to go out with a smile on your face, a pat on the back. They want all these sermons that are about me and how to make me better. It's, no, it's all about Jesus and letting Him conform us and mold us into His image and likeness. If we don't share the love of Jesus with those around us, we're going to shrivel up and die. You know, we're going to be uh, like the salt that loses its savor. Jesus says it's good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled under the foot of men. It's like, we're light, but if you put a basket over the light, what good is that? And so remember that we are simply the vessels of the Lord that He pours His blessings into. But if we don't allow the blessings to flow out of our lives, then we will quickly stagnate and die. And I love the geographical picture of this in Israel because you have three tributaries that flow into uh, the Sea of Galilee. you got the melting snow of Mount Hermon. you got this river from Lebanon. You've got the springs from Dan. They all flow into the Sea of Galilee. And guess what? It's teeming with life. There's birds, there's fish, abundance of wildlife all around the Sea of Galilee. It's beautiful. That's one of my favorite places to go. It's like being up up in the mountains, even though you're like 800 feet below sea level. It's just gorgeous. And then, you know, the outflow, though, you have to have the outflow. That's the Jordan River flowing out of the Sea of Galilee, brings life all the way down the Jordan Valley. All kinds of birds and animals and all the humans that, you know, draw from that, watering all the... The, the vegetables and the fruit gardens and everything they have, and it's just gorgeous. But then it gets down to the Dead Sea. Why is it dead? Because there's no outflow. It's stagnant. Nothing lives around the Dead Sea. There's no birds, no animals. You don't see anything alive around it. It's just dead. And that's the same with us. We have three tributaries, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, flowing into our lives. We should be like the Sea of Galilee. There should be life and abundance. Jesus says, I came that you might have life and that more abundantly. So he fills us with the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, and peace. He does all these things in us, but we can't become stagnant. If you don't let it out, you're going to shrivel up and die. You'll become like the Dead Sea. You need to let it out. You need to look for opportunities to shine the light, share the love of Christ with those around you. Otherwise, you become stagnant. Or, as I get in trouble for saying, a constipated Christian, (laughs) spiritually speaking. Some of you are like, you you what an idiot. He probably says, ain't a lot. Ends the sentences with at. Legalism brings death. Licentiousness brings death. Oh, I'm saved by grace. I can do whatever I want. Rituals bring death. Man-made programs bring death. Again, me-centered sermons, when it's all about me, myself, and I, 
And again, that's what a lot of people want in church today. To build me up, puff me up, make me feel good about myself. That's not what it's about, folks. It's lifting up Jesus and see, you know what? He's got to mold me. He's got to shape me. He's the one that I need to surrender my life to. It's not about me-centered sermons. That will bring death. So walk with Jesus. He is our source of life. In Him is found abundant life. The Holy Spirit brings life. You know, the, the cleanest, freshest vessels that God uses are those who say, Here I am, Lord. Fill me up. And, and that means you need to daily, not just once a week on a Sunday morning, daily feed upon the Word of God. Let the Holy Spirit take the Word and transform you. Pastor Chuck used to say it's the Holy Spirit of God takes the Word of God that transforms the people of God. Very simple approach, but it's so profound. We need to let the rivers of living water flow in and out of our lives. And this is what Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, verse 20, says about just this little vessel. Earlier in in Corinthians, he says, we're just little clay pots. He says, but in a great house, this is 2 Timothy 2.20, in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor, some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, you know, you don't want to be a vessel of dishonor, so I want to be, you know, a vessel of honor. So how do I cleanse myself from being a vessel of dishonor? Well, you humble yourself, you repent. Confess your sins to the Lord. Experience those times of refreshing that comes from Him. He will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the Master, prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lusts. And that's for all of us who are in our 60s and 70s as well. We need to flee those things that are a trap. But pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, again, with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. That's why we need to be in fellowship. You know, women's Bible studies, men's Bible studies. We're going to be starting up in September our life groups. That's an important part of the ministry where you're gathering together with those who are like-minded, who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. So limit your time on CNN and Fox News. You can avoid some foolish and ignorant disputes. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth. And that, and here's how God will use you, that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. I mean, the prodigal son is an example of that. He was taken captive. He got caught up in the worldly things. He finds himself in the mud hole, wrestling the pigs for carob pods. And then he comes to his senses. Oh, man, even my father's servants have it better than this. If I humble myself, go back to my dad, maybe he'll take me back as one of his servants. And you know the story. He heads home. He's humbled. He's broken. And his dad sees him a long ways off. And he runs out to his son. My son, who is dead, has now been brought to life. My son who was lost has been found, and he slaughters a fatted calf, gives him the gold ring, puts a robe around him. He rejoiced, he parted because his son was set free. And we can experience that same joy when we are used by the Lord to set captives free in the power of the Holy Spirit. So look at verse 21. We'll wrap it up here. Verse 21 and 22. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. I love that statement. All the people glorified God for what had been done. When that lame man was first healed, what did they do? They all ran to Peter. Oh, he's the miracle worker. He's the one that did it. Peter's like, no, no, no. It's not us. It's Jesus, the risen Lord and Savior. I mean, this is a perfect example of what Jesus says in uh, Matthew 5, 16. You know, when he says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. 
Yeah, they see good works. They should see good works out of our lives, not because we're trying to earn salvation, but because we are saved. And so they see the good works that are happening in us and through us. And after they see the good works, they glorify your Father in heaven. And so no matter how God uses your life, make sure you always give Him the glory because it's He who is at work in you. He's at work through you. You know, so many people want to be used by God, but they're not being faithful in the little things that God brings into their lives. I mean, I've had people say, oh, I want to go to Northeast India with you. I want to see people get saved and, you know, by the hundreds like you're seeing. And I'm like, um, okay, first of all, you got to be faithful in the little things. Are you being a faithful witness to those around you that you work with in your neighborhood? You know, God's bringing people into your life. And if you're not faithful to share the love of Jesus with that one person, why do you think he's going to send you to minister to hundreds? Be faithful in the little things first. We got a mission field right here in Mesa County. Jesus died for the people in Mesa County just as much as he did there in Northeast India. So what we need is for Jesus to give us a heart for the lost wherever they are. We don't have to cram anything down anybody's throat. Again, we need to speak the truth in love. We need to walk in the Spirit, and then Jesus will use us. It's not a method. It's not a formula. It's not a marketing strategy that we need to reach people. We simply need to be open and honest to God. The Lord, I can't do it, but I know you can. I can't make anything happen, Lord, but if you're opening doors, give me the faith to go through those doors and then look for those opportunities to let him flow in and out of your life. Listen, folks, God has done a radical work in each one of our lives. He's taken us out of darkness. He's transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. He's taken our sins away. He's forgiven us of all of our sins. He's cast them away as far as the east is from the west. The Bible says he remembers them no more. He has saved your soul from hell. And he's preparing a place for you in heaven. Uh, he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And don't forget, and don't take it for granted, that a notable miracle has happened in your life. If you're born again, a notable miracle has happened in your life. Your life is a miraculous life. And so I want to encourage you, live your life for Jesus. Live your life in such a way that other people cannot deny the fact that Jesus is working in you, that He's doing something amazing in your life. They may not like it, but they can't deny it. And that's only possible as we walk with the Lord according to the truth of His Word in the power of the Holy Spirit.